Alrighty then, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Terry Lynn here with Travis Marziani. Today we have an interview with John Tucker about live chat for e-commerce stores and some best practices. But before we start, uh, this episode is brought to you by ShippingEasy.com. They're an online shipping software that lets you pull your orders from your cart, uh, generate shipping labels, send orders to your customers, and also update them with email on the status. So a uh, cool thing is that they also have discount plus shipping rates, which means that you actually get better shipping rates than something like, say, stamps.com or any other bulk carrier you get. Because uh, when they send out the orders, it's considered kind of as a company for them, so they get a bulk discount rate. Uh, when they go out on a consolidated basis. So uh, check them out, shippingeasy.com slash build for a free 90-day trial. So uh, let's get into some updates. Travis, what are you up to, man? So the biggest thing is I've been hitting a lot of the goals that I set. Um, business is making money, which if you've been listening to this show for a while, you'll probably know that summer is a lean time for us and it's officially not summer anymore, which is nice. So things are looking really good. I'm currently just systematizing the business and I'm um, hope well, I am leaving for Nicaragua in about two weeks. Gonna go down, just do some surfing, yoga, and I want to make sure before I leave that everything is flowing. It's looking good, but these these next few weeks are all about making sure all the systems I put in place actually work, and there's no errors, basically. Yeah, so when you're talking about systematizing, what are you systematizing right now? I guess. So, uh, I mean, a lot of it's already been systematized from the beginning, but certain things like posting on Instagram or um, one of the big things we're doing is reaching out to VIPs, like previous customers that have spent more than a certain amount of money with us. We've been doing a couple different things. And I think I talked about this in a previous episode, but I want to start doing handwritten letters to anyone that spends more than $250, let's say. Uh, so after they order, we send them like a handwritten note, like, thank you for your order, because that's big for us. I mean, if someone's going to spend that kind of money, that means that they're probably a dance studio, a dance team, which means they're probably going to buy again and or they have the potential to spend a lot more money with us. I want to make sure and make them happy. Yeah, on a side note, my old roommate that was here is actually working on something like that for e-commerce stores. So he's building an app where, um, you know, every two or three months it pulls your customer data and then they send a card for you too. So they actually use... A custom print service because he used to do like maps he's really into like you know cartography stuff like that postcards so he had this company that prints maps for him and he's kind of like a coder himself so he made this app that's still in beta where i think it'll be for every card but right now it's just shopify where you know you get a customer order it pulls it the address out and then they can make a discount code or whatever to get them to rebuy too so i think it should be live like early next year and i'll get him on the show when he's ready because it's a really cool app because no one wants to like buy 500 postcards and like hand write everything like this thing will just kind of do it for you so it's like a machine that hand hand writes it for you is that no th there oh. are custom print services out there in the u.s that do postcards and he just basically tied mm -hmm. the api and their apis together essentially and like a i see okay i'm a big fan of, though of like a handwritten note because it does seem um it, it seems much more personal and I, you know actually in fact a one of the listeners james uh sent me some some free shirts and this will tie in here in a second but sent me some free shirts he's got a website christmasshirts.com sent me some shirts and on top of the shirts it's not just that he also wrote like a handwritten note saying you know i i love what you're doing with the show i you know keep it up and it was like those little extra touches like if you just would have sent me a shirt i'd be like oh that's cool but a shirt and the note and it made me think uh of a lot of things and one of them's like anyone listening to the show that says like, oh, I don't know how to get publicity for my uh, my business, that's a way to do it. Reach out to podcasters or bloggers, offer them free stuff, write them handwritten notes, do it for the VIPs. And just to you know, plug his uh, business really quick again, christmasshirts.com. I asked him, and we don't get any kind of affiliate commission. I'm like, hey, do you have a coupon code you can share? Because I'd like to, his products are cool. Like they're really neat. And uh, he said, if you use BMOS10 at checkout, you'll get 10% off up until December 1st. So jump on that. Yeah, exactly. All right, yeah, so shout out to uh, James at ChristmasShirts.com. And there's any other listeners here, uh, you guys want to kind of list your store on our website? We thought about this a little bit. So uh, we'll be willing to make a kind of a listener store list and a coupon code if you want to kind of give some more exposure for your store. And we'll give some love to you, link to your store, and all that stuff too. So just shoot us an email, uh, Terry at BillMyOnlineStore.com or Travis at BillMyOnlineStore.com. Let us know your URL. And if you want to give people a code on there when they see it, uh, go ahead and do that. All right, and, and I think, I, oh, sorry, I think this would be really good for a lot of the people that are looking for gifts for friends and family. And, and I'm really bad at that, trying to figure out, oh, what do I get? You know, my sister, I don't know. Uh, oh, here's someone that listens to the show that has this really kind of unique, cool product. Like maybe my sister would enjoy that. So you can help out another entrepreneur. 
that's somewhere in the world yeah, to be kind of spread a the love. cool thing too. Yeah, already. So I guess updates for me. Uh, my Instagram, I've kind of been doing some kind of semi follow, follow, somewhat spammy thing. I'm at like 5,000 followers now. And actually, like two people asked me about uh, products on the wallet. So I'm kind of interested when they're, whether, like, when I start posting more actively, this will increase. So the goal is to get to like 10,000 followers and then uh, start posting more stuff. Uh, just because when I tried it at like, the, you know, the 200 follow level, there was just no engagement because you have no followers. So the idea is that to say, hey, let's get to 10,000 first, see if you post stuff. You get more engagement there and you kind of test out different types of content so we'll see how that goes i should get there probably by late january uh at this at this stage maybe february so i'm doing about uh 500 followers every two weeks or so so it kind of, it kind of sometimes it's more sometimes it's slow but basically uh you know about 2500 a month is your account still private is that the one yes okay yes so i, I it's kind of work it's kind of interesting because when you follow someone i guess they have to follow to see my photo so there's like a 10, about like a 10, 15% follow back rate. So we'll see how, how it goes. I'm just targeting other leather companies to see, um, you know, whether this is the right audience too. So, I mean, who knows? These 10,000 people might just be the wrong people. And I may have just wasted like two months on this. Wait, so what do you mean you're targeting other leather companies? Like their followers? Yeah. So for example, like say Gurkha USA is like a pretty big uh, handbag company. They make like briefcases. So it's like you look at their followers and then you just target those people to get them to follow you back. So ideally, it's that people that are kind of interested in the same niche slash vertical and try to get them uh, on your page. So uh, we'll see how this goes. Did you ever split test it with, uh, I know we talked about like trying it with an open account as well, like seeing if it, it, it making it private really does help or if it just, it would work anyways. Yeah, I, I haven't tried it yet, but just looking at other people that I've tried with open accounts, I don't see them, I don't see their followers growing that much. So I don't know. I think once I hit 10K, I'm going to turn it off because my roommate, did the same thing and then he said once he got to 10k he was getting like you know 200 300 followers a week just organically so maybe you know that is the right point but maybe you need you know 15 to 20 if your targeting isn't that right too so a little experiment in the testing too so also another thing too uh, listed on jet.com so i don't know if you guys have heard of jet.com they're kind of like an amazon competitor uh, who knows where they're gonna get uh, they're kind of playing the angle where uh, you know, we treat our vendors better and we have a more modern site design slash better brands. But uh, I think they just raised like 10 million, which obviously is not enough. It's like pennies if you're going to take on Amazon and who knows how far you're going to get. But I just, you know, applied to list my products there. We'll see how this goes. And if you, you know, it's just like a little listing fee, you know, there's no harm in like, you know, just putting stuff there too, especially if there's all this press around this uh, jet.com right now, I think. I think they actually raised 140 million. Um, yeah, or... I'm looking at the articles right now, and one says raises 500 million from Fidelity. I don't know. They definitely raise more than 10 million, though. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, but I guess it's like for the next month or so, there's this PR thing around it, so maybe there's worth you know some traffic there. We'll see uh, how that goes. Yeah. Yeah. Alrighty. So I guess that's it for this uh, update. Let's get into this episode with John Tucker from Helpflow, and we'll learn about some live chat. And then uh, we'll see you guys in two weeks uh, on the next episode. Today, I've got a special guest, John Tucker from Helpflow, where we're going to talk about the best practices of live chat for e-commerce stores. So, John, how's it going? It's going awesome, Terry. Thanks for having me on the show. Hey, so you reached out to me a couple of weeks ago kind of to talk about live chat and what you're doing. And I just kind of want to get you on, too, because I feel like live chat is a place where people know they should be improving on. And it's kind of a low-hanging fruit that oftentimes we just use it kind of as a reactionary service, too. So today, we're going to talk about some best practices, some case studies you've seen. Uh, doing for e-commerce stores and kind of how to ensure uh, communication is smooth with visitors uh, kind of as your service and as a store owner, you know, kind of some best practices. So I guess, uh, what's your background and how did you get into this whole uh, health flow thing? Yeah, so I, I ran a marketing agency doing online marketing consulting since 2005, very similar to what a lot of the web guys do, you know, SEO consulting, PPC, web design, etc. And um, we kind of stumbled into doing live chat as a service um, as part of that. Uh, we were looking to basically increase the conversion results on our customer or on our client sites at the time. And um, we got live chat on their sites, on a couple client sites. It worked really well when they would run it. And then it got to the point where uh, the clients didn't have time to run it. They didn't want to run it. They felt interrupted throughout the day. So we were at this weird situation, at least for an agency guy, where it's like it's working. The client knows it's working. They totally understood the data and the conversion rate and all that stuff, uh, but they just wouldn't run it themselves. And so I kind of hit this point with uh, one client in particular. And I said, you know, hey, let me run this for you for a week. 
and let's just see how it performs and, and, you know, maybe we'll just do it for you from then on. And so we did that, kind of winged it the first week, to be honest, and it worked really well. And he was really stoked on it, basically saying, okay, great, like now I get the results and I don't have to do any of the work. Um, so I said, oh, there might be a service here. And that's basically how Helpflow started is, um, you know, we're, we're now a live chat service, mainly focused on e-commerce stores. But we basically run the chat system uh, for the actual website owners, for our customers. We chat with their visitors while they're browsing the site and help them out, which results in solid leads, solid uh, solid sales results for their sites. And, you know, um, the store doesn't have to focus on running it themselves. Gotcha. So I guess if I'm going to ask you, like for the e-commerce stores you run, are they mostly like B2B sales or B2C or what type of industry are they mostly in or is it across the board? It's across the board, but the main criteria that we've noticed works well is higher dollar purchases where people are inherently going to have some questions before they buy or need some recommendations. Um, somewhat complicated products, again, where people are going to have questions. And this is kind of the key factor to being able to outsource uh, your live chat to somebody else. There needs to be like a right answer to your product related questions. So what I mean by that is, you know, fashion related items like, um, you know, wallets, for example, or t-shirts or something like that. That's kind of hard to build like a really defined knowledge base around uh, because a lot of it is subjective to the visitor. Uh, we've done well in some of those niches, but our sweet spot seems to be, you know, higher price point, complex products that, uh, you know, people have questions on before buying. Um, I haven't noticed any trends between B2B versus B2C, but um, definitely that's kind of the general direction that we're, we're focused on. Gotcha. So something like maybe like if I sell security cameras or like computer hardware for like entire school where it's like kind of a big purchase, very technical stuff that needs kind of a straight answer for this or that is where you guys specialize in. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't want to kind of say that we're super niche. Um, it's just the main thing that I've noticed is we we don't do well on lower price point around, you know, under a hundred dollar average order value uh, where it's a fairly subjective purchase, um, you know, where it's based on, you know, your taste in terms of fashion rather than whether this thing's going to be compatible with uh, the product you're buying it for. Um, so we, we work with a lot of different niches, but that, those are the niches where I've noticed we don't seem to do that well is lower price point, very subjective. Objective purchases. Yeah, it's like if someone asks you, "Do these pair of shoes that are four hundred dollars look good on me?" Well, you exactly. Might think it looks good, but my friend, my my mom doesn't think it looks good, right? So exactly. <laughs> so those are tough. <laughs> right, cool. So I guess the next big question is, how do you learn about someone's business, and if you're doing this completely for them, like what does the onboarding process look like? Yeah, that that is the most common question we get is, you know, how, how are you possibly going to answer questions from my visitors? Like, you don't know anything about my business, which is true from the beginning, right? But we have a really detailed onboarding process that we've built and some tech that we built for ongoing learning. So I can kind of run you through some of that. Um, you know, the first piece I would say is, you know, we're running chat for so many sites now doing, you're, we're doing, uh, last week we did 3,500 chats. So we, we do a ton of chats for a ton of different sites. And that gives us a lot of data to know, like, regardless of what you sell, what types of questions are people going to ask? So shipping status, order, order tracking, you know, free shipping, warranties, all types of questions. Um, we track all of that. So we have a good database built up of, you know, if you run this type of business, here's the types of questions that we know are going to come up. That's the first piece. So we've got a good starting point there. We've also built a pretty solid process and some tech to be able to basically predict some of the product specific questions that you're going to get. Um, so we just signed up a customer that sells uh, aquarium related products. And there's plenty of sites that sell aquarium related products online. And so we've built some tech that goes out and basically pulls in a lot of product information from all different types of sources online and gives us a pretty solid starting point to know like what are people actually asking on other websites related to these products. Um, and again, you know, that gives us a pretty good seed of information uh, to start with. So we do learn the business, but it's a very data-driven process. Um, we also have an onboarding call that goes into more detail on some of those questions because we, we can't do all of this through you know, our platform. Um, but that gets us to the point where by the day we launch, we have a really solid base of, of questions that are going to get asked. And then after that, um, you know, if we don't know an answer, we have a good process for the visitor to kind of make sure that they do get an answer from the customer, uh, even though we're not able to answer it at that time. So we take good care of them and set good expectations. Um, but when our customer replies to their, to their visitor and answers the question, they BCC our system and that updates it as well. Um, so we have a couple of things built in to be able to basically consistently update our system with more information from our customers. So we've really focused on, you know, systematically learning 
uh, customers' businesses, and it's it's working really well. Yeah, I was looking at some of your old chat logs, and even I think there was one of them when this guy was buying like phones, and he was like, "Well, I don't have the answer to this, but can I get your email?" And then we'll contact you. I was like, oh, that's actually really smart because then, you know, as a chat service, you don't reveal that you don't know the answer, but you're also honest with them that hey, we'll get in touch with you, and then your customer can also follow up and kind of close yeah. it for them too. So it's a very good it's, process. It's really basic, but I think that that's one thing like that's really important to understand about why this business works. What we found is that it's more important to make sure the visitor feels well taken care of and knows that they will get an answer by three o'clock today rather than having the answer right now on the chat. Um, if we can build that rapport with the customer by answering some questions and, and committing to them that you will get an answer today at this time, um, that's what matters. And so it's a simple process. You can see that in the chat logs, but that's that's a big lesson that we learned over time. Yeah, even like as a visitor, if you think about it, it's like even if you don't have the answer for me, as long as I know someone's going to give back to me and it's not like a huge urgent purchase, I generally will be okay with that. If it's within a reasonable time frame, like six hours, 12 hours, same day, even that's fine too, I think most of the time. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, so I guess let's go back into some best practices of live chat. So you said, uh, you know, you guys did 3,500 chats last week. You guys have a lot of data, a lot of products you're going after. So what are like some of the overarching things you guys have built into your best practices when you do it for customers? Yeah, I, I think a good way to start is is some of the mistakes that we see because the, the majority of our customers have had live chat on their site before. They ran it themselves and then they had us take it over. So we see, you know, a lot of um, different ways to run chat, I guess we would say. Um, so some of the mistakes that that stores make is having a really slow first response time or, you know, God forbid, not responding at all. And so what I mean by that is, you know, somebody clicks the chat box because they have a question and the box says, you know, click to chat. They click it. They It automates some message to say, you know, hi, how can I help you or something, right? Like most systems do. They type the message and then nobody responds or it takes like two or three or four minutes for somebody to respond. And that is super, super common when you run the chat yourself or, you know, you have somebody on your team running it because they don't, they're not doing chats all day long. They're not sitting there waiting for a chat to come in. You know, they're processing orders or doing some other things. So I think that's one of the main best practices is you have to respond for that first response time really, really quickly. Uh, we focus on keeping it within four to six seconds uh, 15 seconds maximum. And that is kind of a good window to be in to where visitors, you know, don't realize that it's, you know, just there's nobody there, right? That's the worst thing that can happen is, is if uh, you don't respond at all or you respond really, really slowly. Um, so that's one piece. Another piece that we've noticed in terms of best practice is you don't want to force people through a contact form or a, a pre-chat survey is technically what it's called. Basically, one thing you can do with most chat software, and it makes sense from a marketing perspective to get the data up front, but it's a really bad experience for the visitor. Um, if you basically have the click to chat button on your site and then they click it because they have a question and then it says, we're happy to help you. Can I get your name, email, phone? Um, have you purchased from us before? You know, what's your budget? Are you going to buy today? You know, like uh, people don't ask those crazy questions, but pushing people through a form is just a very bad experience for the visitor. Um, so that's, that's something we see a lot too, is just, you know, doing stuff that makes sense from a marketing perspective. It's great to get the data, but it's not really thinking of the visitor experience. And so when you say response time four to six seconds, it's when they have opened the chat, type something, not like as soon as they're on your site, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So basically that wouldn't be like a invite. Uh, that wouldn't be an invite or something like that where, um, you're inviting them to chat right away on your site. Got it. So if you're doing four to six seconds, does that mean you have like a team 24 hours a day, like just kind of waiting for this pretty much? Or how does it set yeah, up on yeah, your I side? Mean, that, that is how our system's set up. We have a pretty good, uh, good sized group of agents that that's all they do all day is, is live chat for our customers. Um, so we're able to manage the entire business based on that first response time and a couple of other metrics. But that metric is pretty easy to track um, in most of these live chat systems. And so you just want to make sure that you're at least aware of what the number is. If it's 15 seconds, maybe that's fine. If it's 30, that's starting to get up there. But you really want to picture your visitor typing a message because you already invited them to chat, right? Your, your system might even have said, hey, I'm online. Do you have any questions? And then they replied. And if they sit there for 30 full seconds, it's very awkward for a visitor. Um, and so that that's kind of the main thing I think that, at least for listeners to, to keep track of, is like watch that first response time and keep it as low as you physically can. Because as a visitor, the last thing I want to be is that 
this chat shows up. I type something. The guy's not there. I feel like I got duped into typing this chat when no one's there. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So, so say I have a question. Now, what does it look like then on the back end? If say I have a question, like what does the workflow look like to get me the answer that I need? So, so we've built a good amount of tools to be able to do that well. I, I think it's unique for us because, do, I mean, do you want me to explain it from our perspective running chat for a ton of sites or from like an e-commerce store's yeah, e-commerce store from an e-commerce store perspective? I guess what are the cool. most common questions? Usually that you get in live chat then, I guess. So yeah, so so basically somebody's gonna click the chat box or if you invite people to chat on your site, um, you know, they're gonna reply to that. But basically they're gonna ask you a question. That's gonna pop up a screen on your window in the chat interface. Um, a lot of these tools, at least the main, the, the most popular ones, they work pretty similarly. The chat's gonna pop up. You're gonna see the question. You're usually gonna, or you're always really gonna see uh, what page they're on, previous pages that they looked at, um, a lot of tools will show you if they're a returning visitor or not. We take a bunch of other stuff and pump it into the system also, such as like the most common questions for this particular customer and all that. Um, but you're going to basically see some background information about that particular visitor. And then from there, you know, you want to hit that first response time very quickly. Uh, you can do that with, uh, with canned responses and chat templates if you word them carefully. Um, so that way you can respond quickly, but not have to physically type an entire phrase out within four to six seconds. Um, and then from there, it really depends on what the question is, you know, how you're going to answer it. Uh, we see a ton of questions like free shipping policy, shipping time, shipping costs. Is this in stock? Um, you know, what's my order status that they've already ordered? Kind of the, the questions you would expect for an e-commerce store. Um, that's a lot of the questions that come through um, on our customer sites. And so, um, you know, building or being able to answer those questions, especially if it's your store, um, is not really the hardest part. Yeah, would you agree that like, because when I see like the same questions pop up, like do you have free shipping? I feel like it's a bad UI UX thing on your site that like you didn't communicate this clearly. That's why they're asking you in chat. So would it make sense actually if you see, you know, five of the same questions in a month, you should go back and fix that so they stop asking you that? I, I, I thought the same thing when we first got into the business. And what I noticed is a lot of our customers have really well-designed sites. They've got a gigantic free shipping banner and it says, it, like the information is very clear on the page and you still get those questions. And so what I've noticed is like, make sure your site is like well-designed, has the right stuff in place, like isn't like just confusing the heck out of people. But other than that, um, you're always gonna get the questions, especially if the chat box is there. So it's not really a red flag if they're asking those questions, even though you feel like it's, it's clear on the site. Some people just opt to ask. Yeah, so I guess if we're running it themselves, we go back to the response time. Like, say you want to be under 30 seconds. Like, besides notifications, and I was looking at your phone, is there anything else you can really do? Because I guess sometimes you're, like, in the shower, you know, maybe it's, like, five minutes, ten minutes. You're, you know, in the car. You can't always respond right away. Like, is there any way around that? Or is it just kind of that's the best you can do? I mean, the best thing you can do is just make sure you check in and check out. Um, one thing you can do is you can basically say, like, accept chats or don't accept chats. And that's like, I think the main mistake that people make is like they have a sales call and it's only going to be for 20 minutes. So it's like, uh, I'll just get into the sales call and they don't turn the chat off. And then the chat comes in like five minutes into the call and either they reply and they're distracted for both people for the call and the chat um, or they miss it. Um, so I think that even though it's super basic sounding, that's honestly like the best way to make sure that you can at least manage first response time is, um, you know, making sure you're at least available or not available according to, you know, your reality of whether you're available or not for a chat. Yeah, so like, hey, I'm not here right now, but if you leave a message, I'll get back to you when I'm back, essentially. Yeah, exactly. And, and you can you can also configure it where when you're not available, the chat doesn't show up at all on the site. That's an option. Um, you can kind of configure it in a range of different ways. But the bottom line is you want to make sure that you at least uh, kind of say in the chat system with your status, there's status in these systems. Um, you know, my status is online or my status is offline. Gotcha, gotcha. So going back a little bit, you were talking about how uh, you guys built Google Analytics into the chat kind of events you have. So uh, is this something that most chat software has or is it kind of something you guys custom built just for your guys as an agency in some ways? So so a lot of them do have it built in. Um, Live Chat Inc. has it built in. I believe Olark does. Um, so it's something that you can definitely 
do in most systems. And if you're using a system that doesn't have anything like that built in, you may want to move to something else because there's so many chat softwares out there now. Um, so it wasn't actually crazy complicated for us to build that particular part for what, what we needed. Um, but that's definitely something if you're going to start with um, a live chat software, that's uh, I would want to make sure to have that at least for an e-commerce business. And, and it's pretty common. Yeah, so where would you see the data? Would it be in like campaigns or? No, no, or... it's events. So basically... Uh, okay. Yeah, so it's event tracking. So for listeners that aren't like super familiar with Google Analytics, basically you can filter all of the data. So you can basically like put these goggles on for Google Analytics that says, you know, sh only show me people that I actually chatted with. And then you can just browse through Google Analytics and see all the data that analytics provides, but only for the people that chatted. So it's technically done with event tracking. Gotcha. And then if there's e-commerce checkout, it'll link it to that event too. And you can see exactly what's coming in, what's coming out. Exactly. So we've got some crazy data that we publish on the site. It's all anonymized, obviously, but, um, you know, we track exactly how many dollars are produced for uh, our customers from people that we chatted with. So we've got customers that are paying us, you know, 150 bucks a week and, you know, we're generating them four thousand forty five hundred dollars in revenue per week. And that's only from people that we chatted with. And that doesn't include like phone orders or people that came back later on a different computer. There's a lot of holes in the data. Um, so that's how we track all of that data is through uh, through the Google Analytics integration. Yeah, because I noticed some of your chat logs, there were like phone orders or like phone follow-up. So do you consider that as like a referral sale or is that just kind of you guys don't even look at that once the customer talks to them? We, we don't. We don't. And honestly, like we we don't really know what our cancellation rate is because cus the right customers that we work with, like they just don't cancel. The Google Analytics integration is just there. So like if the data is trackable, then we got it. Um, but otherwise, what we've noticed is like we don't need to get too granular um, to try to make the business case for it, especially like when you look at some of those chat transcripts. I mean, those are like $10,000 orders, $5,000 orders. Like we get one of those one or two of those a quarter and it's like our cost of service is, is handled at that point for them. Yeah, exactly. So I guess uh, is that kind of like a normal ROI across your store for like, you know, say 200 bucks uh, a week, but you're getting them four thousand dollars. Or that's just kind of like an anomaly. Like, where's like the benchmark? For you I, I wouldn't say it's an anomaly. I mean, that one, um, that one's high. Um, like, it's a high example. It sounds high, which is great. Um, but that's on an average order value of a hundred bucks. I think that customer's a hundred, hundred five dollars. So it's not like they're selling gigantic equipment or something. Um, we've got another one right now on the site, which is one hundred forty seven dollars a week, and I think it's twenty two hundred dollars on average. So a little bit lower. But again, average order value of like. I forget the specifics. I think that one's 85 bucks. Um, so both of those are, are fairly typical. Um, what we always see is that visits that we chat with, people that we chat with, convert three to, time, three to nine times more than visitors that don't chat. So the conversion rate for people we chat with is, is that much higher. Um, so it all depends on like the quality of your traffic, who you have on the site, and how the site's performing already. But if you have a, a site that's already producing sales, having the live chat on there, whether it's us or you managing it, is going to produce more results. Because it's just, again, you know, it's a better experience for the visitor having somebody there to help, and that is going to produce more sales. Yeah, I saw one of your sites was a pro teeth guard. That was my friend JP's site. I guess yeah. he sells like dental stuff. So I guess for people listening who doesn't know, I guess uh, basically if you need like a mouth guard, you usually go to a dentist, you spend 400 bucks, he gets a mold of your teeth and he sends it to you. But I guess he kind of sends you the kit. You do it at home and then, you know, he sends it, you send it to him and then he mails you the kit. And you pretty much get like probably like anywhere from like 30 to 50% off normally what you would pay for. And I guess you guys run the chat for him because a lot of people probably have questions, right? Like, oh, is this safe to put in my mouth or you know, how fast am I going to get my mold and all this stuff too. So it's kind yeah, of Yeah, yeah. JP was customer number like six or seven very early, gave us a shot. I knew him from some other stuff I had worked on before. Um, and one thing that was really good, there's JP, there's another guy from e-commerce fuel named Dan that runs a golf, uh, basically golf accessories site. I won't give him the niche, I guess. But um, basically those two guys are very systematic um, in terms of how they think very process driven. So they were actually really helpful in the early days. Like uh, I'm very systematic driven also, but working with them, uh, really helped us like flesh out the model. And, you know, both of them are still with us today. I just got an email from Dan earlier today about like just him being stoked on one of the chats that we did. Um, he reads through everything still after almost a year. Um, but yeah, um, JP is an awesome guy and he, he gave us a shot and, uh, it's been really good so far. Yeah. Well, I think he's kind of like an engineer background. And I guess like you, you can be systematized on your end, but you need the client side to kind of know what their side is too, to really make it work, I guess, starting out. But 
that was a long time ago, I guess, for you. <laughs> yeah, we're we're getting better at that though. Like we we're actually we focused a lot on the onboarding process in the last really like six to nine months. Focused on a lot of stuff, but the onboarding process was one big piece where you know, how can we get the best possible information before we launch and then after we launch um, in an efficient way from our customers. And so we've tested a lot of different ways to do the onboarding. Um, and so, you know, some of that came from the experience with JP and Dan and some of the other early customers. And then also just trial and error, you know, figuring out what is the best way to, you know, be able to do customer service for any business uh, and learn it quickly. Yeah, like the ideal thing is just like to hire you guys, have an onboarding call, and then you just bring the money essentially without bugging them about this question or that question. Exactly. So, yeah. All right, cool. So I guess now let's move on to a little bit back about live chatting. So like what are some ninja tips, advanced stuff that people can do besides kind of getting your response time down and having the kind of basics set up? Yeah, so uh, there's a couple different ones. Um, the first one is using automatic invites to invite people to chat based on the likelihood of them having a question. And so what I mean by invite people to chat is when they're browsing the site, um, the chat box can open open up automatically um, and basically say, you know, sorry to interrupt you, I'm online if you have any questions or something along those lines. We've tested a lot of the wording of the invites, but the advanced tactic that you want to use is getting really granular with those invites of when you invite people to chat. So if somebody is in the checkout process and then they back out, that's an indicator that they have a question that might cause them to abandon. Uh, if they're in the checkout process and then they click through to the shipping policies page, right, like a separate page, that might be another indicator. Um, that's some pretty basic examples but some of the other stuff we've done is you know tracking if somebody's bouncing back and forth between two different products in a specific category and they're just going they've, they've gone back and forth between the two that indicates that they're comparing those products right um, and some sites have really good comparison features some sites don't but you can track a lot of information about what somebody's thinking on their site on your site based on what they're doing. And so that's one of the things that we do is, you know, basically invite people to chat based on what they're doing and the likelihood that they have a question. And again, makes an awesome experience for the visitor where it's like they're comparing two products, they're trying to figure things out. Then we pop up and say, you know, do you have any questions I can help with? And they're like, actually, yes, like I'm trying to compare these products. Um, and then they give us the question. So that's one piece that that works really well. Um, another part I guess before before you go into the next one, does that work if I have two windows open? Like if I have product A on one tab, product B on one tab, like does the software still know that I'm comparing them or does it have to be like a back and forth in one window? It kind of should. I would, I'd have to look to test that. Um, I'm almost positive it does because our system tracks what page you're on when the chat's happening or, or even when the chat's not happening. If the chat, if you see a chat box on the site, it's tracking you. Um, it should. It's probably based on how the browser is configured, but I, I will test that. I assume it does. And for sure, if you were chatting in one window, then you clicked over to the other window and you started chatting there, the conversation continues between the two. It's all one chat box. And yeah. so it should track it. Because I'm just asking that because if I'm comparing two things, I would have two tabs. I don't know if I would be going back and forth in the same window. I'd probably have like two or three tabs open, but I don't know if everyone does that now. I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, I think I think less savvy people probably, probably yeah, manually like, click back and forth and write it in their notebook on yeah, their desk like or something. Yeah, my mom would totally do that because she doesn't even know how to like really send emails too. So Yeah. <laughs> All right. So sorry I interrupted. Uh, you had one more tip to go? Yeah, the other one I had, it depends on what data you have um, to integrate, but you can bring a lot of data into the actual chat window um, to know more stuff about the people you're chatting with. So for example, um, you could bring in data about their past purchase history. So you know like if this person has bought you know, thousands of dollars worth of product in the last six months, um, that's, that's helpful information to know. Uh, you know, make sure you respond to that person really quickly and help them out. Um, you can integrate your CRM data into it as well um, to basically get similar types of information. Um, you know, basically bringing in data from other systems, other analytics systems, KISS metrics, things like that. Um, it requires some programming in most cases, but it can make it so that, especially for higher traffic sites, you can start to get a lot of really powerful insight without having to ask. Um, for example, if they say, you know, I had 
you know, when is my order shipping? Uh, I placed it on Monday, right? And that's all they say. If you have the order and the shopping cart data right there, you can say, are you talking about the, you know, custom pen that you purchased on Monday? Um, that should ship out tomorrow. Like that's again, a great experience for the visitor. So you can integrate a lot of other data sources into the chat. Gotcha. So to identify them, you would need like their email or name first. So they would need to like give that to you, right? Cause if they just show up in a chat, how would you know who they are? You can do it based on cookies. So basically, and this is where the crazy programming stuff comes in. But um, if they've ordered, you can cookie the order information. And then um, I, th I guess the, the easy way to explain it is there's other systems that track this stuff. Kiss Metrics, for example, tracks a ton of stuff about you. Um, you can configure the live chat window to read third party cookies. It's a little bit technical to do. So the live chat system isn't technically keeping track of your order history. It's technically reading another cookie where that history is. Gotcha. So it's pulling the data from your cart or whatever third party thing you have. And then you can pull that data right in the chat as you do it. Interesting. Yeah, it depends on what system. To be clear, like like the Salesforce integration, I think that technically pulls directly from Salesforce. Um, but you can hack together integrations that aren't technically built. Like it's not meant to pull the data in there. You can technically pull a lot of that stuff in if you wanted to. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, cool. So I guess uh, the last question I have is that if you're going to, if you have live chat or if you're not using it right, like is there any software you would recommend people starting out with or where should they go? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a whole bunch of different ones. Um, we, we have something we publish called the Definitive Guide to Live Chat. And there's no email opt-in or anything. Um, so I'll shoot you the link after, but it's just thelivechatguide.com. And the last, I think it's the last chapter. There's a chapter in there that talks about the different tools that you could choose from. Um, we recommend a, like the main top tools like Live Chat Inc. Um, is what we would recommend or Olark. Um, there's a couple really big, big people in the space. But in that chapter, it talks through like the features to make sure that it has. Um, there, I don't know how many chat softwares there is, probably thousands, maybe tens of thousands. Um, there's a ton, but... The features is what matters. Um, and so things like being able to track first response time, being able to track response time, uh, being able to invite people to chat, um, being able to basically transfer chats between team members is really important. Uh, the features are the part that matters. But if you're just looking for something right out of the box just to get started right away, I'd recommend Live Chat Inc. They, they have a very solid tool set. Yeah, because it sounds like the key is to take it from being a reactive thing into something more proactive and kind of useful than just kind of like it sits there as a window and then you wait exactly Gosh. yeah one thing on on that note because i know we've touched on like the reactive stuff and like inviting or proactive and uh inviting people to chat be careful with getting too marketing focused on inviting people to chat like if they're on a product page about um you know custom microphones or something like I would be weary of saying, you know, can I answer any questions about our custom microphones or we have a discount today if uh, you have any questions or something. What we've noticed is like you want to be low pressure and borderline informal when you actually invite people to chat. You don't want to integrate like product names and their name or their past order history or something creepy. Um, so definitely use greetings, but don't get too sales focused on those. The purpose of it is just to kind of say, you know, hey, do you need any help? I'm here if you, if you need help. Hey, notice in your chat logs, the first line is always like, hi, sorry to interrupt. I want to let you know I'm online. Anything I can help you with? Is that something you guys have tested? Like yes. A lot yeah. Or? And that's that's what I mean by informal. Um, you know, for listeners, if you look through the chat transcripts that it basically says, sorry to interrupt you. I wanted to let you know I'm online. Do you have any questions I can help with? And so that's very carefully worded to basically, you know, acknowledge that we are technically interrupting them like they didn't ask for the window to pop up. So that kind of lowers the guard a little bit. Um, I wanted to let you know I'm online, which basically means like I'm available if you need me, like um, we have people here to help. And then, you know, do you have any questions I can help with is like a direct uh, ask, essentially. Um, so I, I don't want to say like we've trademarked that or some crazy like aha moment. But we noticed like if you integrate any sort of sales speak, any sort of discount codes, any sort of just anything sales driven, um, it just rubs people the wrong way and they, they think it's automated anyway. Um, if you keep it informal and you know just very low pressure, um, the response rate is much better. Yeah, I noticed the framing of that is that when you first say, sorry to interrupt, even if you're not interrupting them or you are, like you cover your ass on kind of both sides where like they can't get mad because you already apologized. 
preemptively in some ways too. So like the framing psychologically is really interesting how, because it's like when you go to a mall, it's like, oh, hey, do you need anything? Do you need any help? I'm like, well, I'm just, I'm, people always say, I'm just looking. Right? Whereas like if someone said, hey, sorry to interrupt, do you need any help? Then you feel a lot more like, oh, okay, no, I'm okay. Like you don't have this standoffish attitude that you get maybe when you visit a retail store. Too. Cause like, cause every time the retail store, these people walk, hover around you. You're just like, oh, like I think your guard starts going up. Or it's like this kind of transcript lowers it a little bit too, uh, like you said. Yep. Yeah, and they, I think what happens, like this part's hard to test, but I think what it does is they they feel like you were literally like your job is to watch people while they're on the site. And then if you think they need help to press some sort of button that like invites them. Um, so that is part of the reason why we didn't include any product information, any data about you, like no special offer. Like it literally looks like I physically typed out the message and said, hey, I'm here if you need some help. Um, you know, sorry to interrupt you. Um, so I, I think that's what it does is like they picture somebody physically typing that message, even though it is automated. Yeah. Um, but as soon as they reply, it's not automated yeah. for so us. Protocol wise, if they don't reply, I guess you guys just close it, right? Because they're not interested in having any help. Or is there some follow up that usually happens? Or I'm just... we, um, so if they don't reply at all, usually they will close it, um, or they'll minimize it, and then that will close it after a certain amount of time. Um, like it'll end the chat, um, or they'll just say no thanks. Um, we get a good amount of people that say that, and we try to track that over time too um, to see like are the greetings are too aggressive. Um, but with that really low pressure wording, like we don't get uh, many responses where people are just like, Go just away. angry. Like, yeah, like, exactly. Are you? Like, why are you stalking me? <laughs> yeah. We've had customers though. We, we've had a couple of customers say, you know, um, if they don't respond to that, like maybe you can follow up with like a special offer or like, you know, follow up with them. And our view, like that's one thing that sets us apart from a lot of competitors or just like the way people think about doing this stuff. Um, we are exclusively focused on making sure like it's as awesome as possible for your website visitor. Um, we're not going to be at, um, exclusively focused on harvesting as many leads as possible or converting as many sales as physically possible um, if that impacts the visitor experience in a bad way. Because if the visitor experience is awesome um, and they feel really well taken care of, your lead conversion rate and your sales conversion rate will go up. Um, so that we told the, that customer no we said you know here's why we can't do that and you know we've tested some things in the past on our own sites and it just doesn't work well if you push people um because you got to envision what it would be like for someone to do that like live in person in a retail store like you'd get annoyed pretty yeah, quickly exactly. and i feel like nowadays people are getting trained to wait for discount codes you know it's not like when you get retargeting ads or card abandonment emails you're like yep i'm just gonna wait and i'm gonna wait for that 10 percent off and then i'll do my checkout because I think I feel like people are trained to do that now, and if you just add this to live chat, it just complicates it even more. Yeah, so, and one one thing that's good I think about live chat is, you know, when the chat box is there, we get a lot of people asking, you know, do you have any discount codes? And that gives the business an opportunity to either provide one if they want to, or say it depends, and you know, they give us some criteria to use. Um, or say no, like we don't discount our products because they're awesome and, you know, here's why we don't do it. Um, but it gives them the opportunity to like directly address it now. So like it, it uh, makes that purchase decision happen today rather than saying, you know, we'll see if they shoot me an email or we'll see if they, you know, run some ads with a discount code on there. Awesome. All right. So I guess uh, that's it. That's all from me. Uh, if you guys want to find out more about Helpflow, check out helpflow.net. Uh, go to the resources section. They got a definitive guide to live chat. That's super cool. Uh, I'd also check out their live transcripts. I actually spent probably like, you know, 10, 15 minutes looking through some old chats. It's pretty interesting to see kind of how their process works too, if you guys need some help with this too. But uh, I guess that's it. John, anywhere else, uh, how we can connect with you in case I No, I, th I think that's the best bet. If you want to get straight to the live chat guide, it's just thelivechatguide.com. That'll redirect you to that page on the site. So um, I, I just set that up so it'd be easy for your people to get to. Awesome. All right, John, thanks so much. And we'll keep in touch and I'll let you know.